Welcome to our second fall WAP research seminar series. WAP equips leaders and change makers with rigorous evidence-based strategies to advance women and gender equity. I'm Erica Chenoweth, Frank Stanton Professor of the First Amendment at Harvard Kennedy School, and a Susan S. and Kenneth L. Wallach Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Before we start, we wanted to offer a virtual land acknowledgement to honor local indigenous communities on the land where Harvard University sits. The WAP team have posted the link to our land acknowledgement in the chat and encourage you to explore the resources in addition to reading the statement that they posted there. Our seminar this fall will explore how gender researchers, policymakers, and practitioners can commit to strengthening the focus on intersectional research. We will explore how gender intersects with other social identities such as race, class, national origin, disability, parental status, and sexual orientation. Our intersectional focus will not only address the unique experiences of people with intersecting identities, but also engage with the systemic biases and oppressions which characterize these experiences. Many of the researchers we are featuring in our seminar series are also featured on our Gender Action Portal. And I encourage you all to explore GAP's intersectional work at gap.hks.harvard.edu. Today, we're very lucky to have Professor Tabitha Benia presenting which identity frames boost mobilization in the Black Lives Matter movement. Professor Benia is Assistant Professor in Human Development and Social Policy and Faculty Fellow at the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern University. As a political scientist, she broadly examines how elite communication influences voter opinions of candidates and political policies. In particular, her work focuses on how messaging polarizes attitudes or can bridge attitudinal divides with substantive focuses on important to topics in American politics, ranging from gun control to human trafficking to Black Lives Matter. Her most recent work examines how identity contextualizes messages around policy. We will be recording today's seminar to post on our YouTube page. We are so pleased to have a lasting and broad reaching impact beyond those who are able to attend the virtual seminar today. Our speaker will present for 45 minutes and then we will have 15 minutes for questions from our virtual audience. We ask that you hold your questions until the end of the talk. Those who have a question will have the opportunity to be unmuted to ask it out loud. We do ask that any audience questions be very brief, be on topic, be posed in the form of a question and be related to our presenters research. My colleague Katie Omberg will be managing the Q&A portion of the seminar. With that, I will turn it over to you, Professor Benito. All right, thank you. Just a minute to share my screen. Okay, I'll trust you all will let me know if you cannot see that. Um, I want to, before I begin, I do also want to acknowledge that the land that I am sitting on here in Evanston, Illinois, is the historic homeland of the Council of Three Fires. And my hope is that we can honor that history, not just with our words, but also by our learning and our action uh, moving forward. Um, so I also wanted to acknowledge that um, the, the article behind this talk is co-authored with uh, Professor Alvin Tillery, who's in the political science department here at Northwestern, um, and to um, just let you all know that this is uh, joint work. And so the question in this article um, that, we're, that we're here to talk about today is really thinking about the way in which Black Lives Matter and identity framing within the movement of Black Lives Matter speaks to how the Black public in the United States conceptualizes um, the movement itself. So to understand our work here, I'll talk first a little bit about the development of the movement itself, although I'm sure we're all fairly familiar about it, familiar with it by now, um, and the goals of the founders of the movement. And I'll also explain why we thought the identity framing was a particularly important piece in the development and mobilization of the Black public around Black Lives Matter. And finally, I'll talk about our experiment um, and how the Black pu public views and supports Black Lives Matter when we dig deeper into these intersectional frames that the propagators of the movement use to, to introduce it to the public. Uh, okay, so first of all, I think um, the, the origins of the movement started as an online movement um, when three women, Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, 
Garza and Opal Tometi posted a hashtag Black Lives Matter on Twitter in response to the acquittal of George Zimmerman, the shooting of Trayvon Martin. Um, this came out of, uh, potentially came out of a, a separate class. Um, so it's not necessarily their initial phrase, um, but they were the ones who propagated and are credited with, with the founding of this burgeoning movement. And this became a slogan and organizing principle for um, for at least 35 protests that year, and that continued um, through the summer of the 2014 and uh, again in 2016. And I think this is widely recognized as the movement that has um, had the most protests worldwide, particularly following last summer's uh, movement or protests um, in addition. So what's interesting about Black Lives Matter, if we contextualize this in the history of social movements, is the idea that it is very different uh, from the social movements that we saw in the 1960s. So um, the older, mo so within the new social movement th thesis, um, the scholarly consensus is that Black Lives Matter um, is a part of the new social movement. And these movements are aimed at expressing or performing claims around identity, such as race, gender, LGBTQ affiliations, more so than winning materialist gains or shaping actual political processes. These movements tend to use the disruption of societal norms as their main tactic um, to garner attention to their issues. And what's interesting when we think about how these new social movements stack up to old social movements um, is that the work it seeks to undertake and the prominence that it has within public discourse means that the way it shifts public attention and pushes policy changes may be different from older social movements. So the movement's incredibly interesting because of the distinct ways that it operates um, separately from other movements in the past. So um, while older social movements in the 1960s contained very strong leadership models that were centralized um, and top-down approaches, um, it meant that the messages and physical actions of these older social movements, such as lunch counter sit-ins and bus boycotts, were targeted and facilitated by central leadership, and resource mobilization was aimed at very specific political goals. In new social movements, however, there's a quite a contrast um, because the leaders themselves are not visible or strongly um, guiding the movement in the same way as the older social movements. So the key difference here is the usage of on, online presences and social media platforms to disseminate these messages. So what this means is that these movements tend to have decentralized leadership models that different pieces of the, org or the organization or the movement can orchestrate different actions and different messages. So that means that Black Lives Matter activists uh, may spend more time on, on politics of signific signification that may vary across separate arms of the movement. Um, all right. I'm sorry. Something happened and I'm stuck. There we go. So what's interesting about Black Lives Matter then is the focus of the leadership that centers on intersectionality. Um, because of their unique attention to recognizing these crit critical distinctions within Black communities throughout the United States and the ways that those different communities have experienced prior activism and distinctions and discrimination in general. So Alicia Garza, who's one of the co-founders of the movement, describes it this way. Black Lives Matter is a unique contribution that goes beyond extrajudicial killings of Black people by police and vigilantes. Black Lives Matter affirms the lives of Black, queer, and trans folks, disabled folks, Black und undocumented folks, folks with record, women, and all Black lives along the gender spectrum. It centers those that have been marginalized within Black liberation movements. What Alicia Garza and Patrice Cullors identify throughout their writings on Black Lives Matter is a central concept of intersectionality within the Black Lives Movement. Um, so, so I think probably in this seminar, you're all relatively familiar with Black Lives Matter, or with intersectionality. So I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper. Uh, I'll glance over it probably more than I would otherwise in other talks. Um, but it, intersectionality has long been part of civil rights social movements, um, particularly within Black communities. We see it in the Kambahi River Collect Collective and Audre Lorde's writings. We see it in the Chicanismo movement and Dolores Huerta. Um, 
But in academic spaces, we know that the term grew out of Martha Crenshaw's work in the late 1980s. Um, and intersectionality theory recognizes the concept that marginalized in individuals exist and experience their racial, gender, sexual, and class identities concurrently, which means that interconnected forms of disadvantage exist for those who identify as part of marginal marginalized groups across multiple identities. And this form of discrimination is unique to those with overlapping or intersectional uh, identities. Um, and the corollary of this idea is that marginalized individuals must confront what Patri uh, Patricia Collins calls interlocking systems of oppression based on their class, gender, race, and sexual identities. Sarah Jackson has conducted research examining Black Lives Matter activists and has also confirmed the commitment to intersectional messaging and the uniqueness of it within Black Lives Matter. So for so while many other social movements have components of the movement that speak to intersectional messaging, what's interesting and unique about Black Lives Matter is that it's centered within the very foundations of the movement. And she writes that, um, Jackson writes that Black Lives Matter organizational founders and members of the larger movement for Black Lives Matter Collective have insisted on discourses of intersectionality that value and center all lives, um, including Black women, femmes, queer, and trans folk. But as we all know, the public's focus can differ. So it is the case that within Black Lives Matter, um, Shatima Thedcraft has noted that Black female and LGBTQ plus, uh, LGBTQ plus victims have received less attention in the movement's condemnations of state violence and rituals of public mourning. So separately, um, my co-author Al has examined tweets between December 2015 and October of 2016 and found that the modal tweet was an emotional response that included expressions of sadness, um, such as outrage and despair, um, and uh, utilized um, sorry, and generated more tweets that frame the movement as a struggle for individual rights rather than ones that use frames around gender, racial, or LGBTQ identities. Um, and we'll see this publicly as well, this push for a more inclusive messaging um, where we see hashtag say her name stemming from a reminder that Black women are subject to police violence as well and that we need to pay attention when Black women are killed or harmed by police in the same way um, that Black men are. And then the hashtag Black Trans Life Matter also reminds us that Black trans individuals uh, face incredibly high levels of violence generally and in uh, some cases some of the highest rates of police, uh, death by police. So we see these conversations both on an academic level, but also on a public level, um, continually pushing for the idea that this is an intersectional movement. Um, but what's important is that there's general evidence um, that not everyone is on the same page with what identity means in context of Black Lives Matter. Uh, I'm gonna, so this is, this is just from Al's paper and I'll just show you briefly. This, these are the findings. So you can see, um, I think we would think of the LGBTQ and feminist frames as potential intersectional frames compared to a cultural, racial, or liberal frame. And we can see that while they do occur, they're a much smaller percentage um, compared to the liberal or cultural frame um, that, that we might be most familiar with. Okay, so given this background, the question that we ask in the paper and what we find interesting is what this means for support of Black Lives Matter. So what is the work that intersectionality is doing within the Black Lives Matter movement? Do intersectional messages mobilize subgroups such as Black women uh, or Black LGBTQ identifiers? Um, we know that group consciousness is grounded in gender identity can be a potent mobilizer of women's participation in both social movements and electoral politics. Public opinion polls have also found that African-American women demonstrated a higher commitment to feminist values than did white women, and feminist consciousness drives African-American women to heighten levels of engagement, participation, and substantive representation in politics in the African-American community. Um, Similarly, Black LGBTQ plus identifiers work within Black social movements or working within Black social movements is not new, right? So as Audre Lorde describes how the existence of Black, lesbian, and gay people was not even allowed to cross the public consciousness of Black America, um, despite her work within the, the larger movement as a whole. And so similarly, conversations around the Black community continue to be much 
less represented in discussions. So, so then our curiosity um, is what these intersectional mem uh, messages do. Um, do they mobilize the groups for whom they're, uh, the, the sub-communities within Black communities who might face um, more or different marginalization, um, more mobilized by these intersectional frames, or do they demobilize other people with whom uh, they leave about? So, um, right, sorry, here we go. So our three hypotheses are first, um, Black nationalist frames of the Black Lives Matter movement should increase support of the movement across African-American subjects. So as we're familiar with linked fate um, and and with this idea that Black nationalism um, really strengthens and ties the community together, we might anticipate that any frame that calls for collective action among Black communities as a whole, speaking to the idea that um, these communities um, are subject to similar fate, um, would lead to higher levels of mo mobilization across the community as a whole. But we also have subgroup hypotheses. So we would imagine that these intersectional, pro um, intersectional framings might matter differently um, to different subgroups within Black communities. So if we have a Black feminist frame of the Black Lives Matter movement, Will this increase support um, among African American women to whom the Black feminist frame might be speaking in particular? Um, given the fact that we know that African American women do, do see heightened levels of mobilization. At the same time, it's possible that this intersectional framing for Black women um, might, or a Black feminist frame, might decrease the mobilization um, of Black men who might have a, a negative reaction or perceive then that Black Lives Matter movement is less for them and, and more for Black women. Similarly, if we're thinking about LGBTQ frames of, of the Black Lives Matter movement, we might think in a similar frame that Black LGBTQ members might react more positively and more supportive of Black Lives Matter as a result of this messaging, recognizing that their, group, their specific subgroups needs are being spoken to, um, but they may also have a demobilizing effect on Black subjects who do not identify as LGBTQ+. Okay, so to test these frames, um, we use an experiment um, that we, sorry, um, that we deployed to 845 Black residents in the United States. Um, and we deployed this in February 15 to 23rd of 2019. Um, and this was a, a uh, census matched on age, gender, and region across the United States. Um, subjects were asked a series of demographic questions, and then they were asked about their extent of knowledge about Black Lives Matter. And then they were randomly assigned to one of four treatment messages, which I will get to in just a moment. Um, and then we gave them several questions about their support, support for Black Lives Matter, their perceptions of the movement's effectiveness, and their trust for the movement in general. We also asked subjects to write a letter about Black Lives Matter to Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House. Um, and yes, we really wanted this to be a message to their own unique representative, um, but just based on, on deception and the fact that we could not send letters um, to all the different representatives, uh, we, we settled on Nancy Pelosi as the Speaker of the House um, as symbolic of representative uh, as symbolic of representation for the for the country as a whole, um, and and seemed like in this case it probably didn't matter as much as it might have otherwise. Okay, so the four the four treatments that we presented could be divided into two different types of messages: those that described a unifying goal within Black communities, and then those that described intersectional goals and recognized the marginalization of specific subgroups within Black communities in the United States. So the unifying messages or treatments are presented here. The first message we refer to as a control because it's the most general message around Black Lives Matter. Um, it reads, Black Lives Matter was created in response to the sustained and increasingly visible violence against Black communities in the United States. They believe in elevating the experience of the Black people as American citizens with constitutional rights. They're intentional about amplifying the particular experience of violence that Black people face. 
Within the nationalist treatment, which as a reminder, we thought might elevate support of all respondents, regardless of their gender or LGBTQ identification, we strongly emphasize um, black nationalism. So we included um, that we, we thought that Black Lives Matter um, elevated the experience of black people as a distinct nation within a nation through an ongoing call and struggle for reparations for the history and continuing harms of colonialism and slavery. Um, and then we also added at the end um, that they are intentional about amplifying particular experience of violence descendants of African people face in their struggle for self-determination. So language that we directly pulled um, from black nationalist messaging. The intersectional treatments similarly repeat that very first sentence in that control message, but then they emphasize the particular struggles of the communities um, that they're speaking to. So for the Black feminist um, uh, framing, we talked about the most marginalized Black people, especially women, and that Black Lives Matter was intentional about amplifying the particular experience of gendered violence that Black women face. Um, and similarly, we use uh, that same type of language for LGBTQ plus treatment. So Black Lives Matter believed in elevating the experiences of the most marginalized Black people, especially those who identify as queer, trans, gender nonconforming, and intersex. Um, and that Black Lives Matter is intentional about amplifying the particular experience of non-heteronormative violence that Black LGBTQ plus individuals face. Okay, so first, before I get to the experiment results, I just kind of wanted to go over um, general findings we found about how this group viewed Black Lives Matter. And I think it's somewhat unsurprising, particularly as some of the reporting has talked about um, this distinct uh, difference between Black communities and white communities and their understanding of, of Black Lives Matter. Um, but I think it's really important to emphasize that regardless of what our findings um, for subgroup level is, overall there's a high degree of familiarity and support for the Black Lives Movement generally. So in these figures I have on the x-axis, um, the responses, so ranging from um, low at the at the left end and high on the right end. And in this, and then on the y-axis, I just have the number of respondents. Um, so for this question, how familiar are you with Black Lives Matter? This dash line is showing us that the, the mean response is that most people are saying they understand it, right? So more than half the sample is very familiar um, with Black Lives Matter. Um, then we also asked if they're supportive of the goals of Black Lives Matter. And again, on a five point scale, most of our sample, the mean response was that people support it. Um, and very few people were opposed or strongly opposed to it in our sample. Um, and of course the modal response um, was that there was strong support for Black Lives Matter. So the final descriptive question is how much, if at all, do you generally trust the goals of Black Lives Matter? And again, we see a very high mean response. Um, so um, most people are saying that they trust Black Lives Matter a moderate amount, um, but most people, again, the modal response is that they very much trust Black Lives Matter, which I think, again, is very unsurprising given that um, this is a movement uh, that, that Black communities seem to be visibly um, in favor of. So what do we find then for our experiment? Um, and I'll, I'm presenting these results here as a result of just the OLS regression. So comparing, using the control as a baseline response um, with the nationalists in the triangle frame, um, the X, oh, you probably can't see my arrow, the X uh, as the feminist frame, and then that diamond as the LGBTQ plus framing. The dashed line here is showing that um, there would be no treatment different, no treatment effect, no difference between the control and that uh, that treatment. And then these bands are the 95% confidence interval um, difference. So I have my four DBs here, support for Black Lives Matter, effectiveness to Black Lives Matter, um, if people trust the goals of Black Lives Matter, and then finally an index, which is the variable that's created of these three variables, as well as um, two other variables about if they think Black Lives Matter is effective um, for Black communities as a whole. Um, and I think one other question. Um, 
And so I'll just I'll primarily talk about the findings on the index only because I think for the most part, the results are the same. Um, so, and this is, oh, sorry. I think I, I think I accidentally didn't put in the full sample results, but that's okay. Our, our hypotheses are more about moderation. When we look at the full hypothesis results, we don't actually see any treatment effects. It's only when we divide based on gender. So I'm presenting here is the black men in our sample. And what we can see is that um, the nationalist framing, which we thought would have a positive effect on mobilization or support for Black Lives Matter has, has a statistically zero effect. Um, whereas the feminist and the LGBTQ plus framings are both negative for most of our dependent variables and, and uh, statistically significant for several of them. So what we're seeing here in this sample is that rather than um, the Black nationalist movement increasing support for Black Lives Matter, it's actually decreasing support. The intersectional frames are actually decreasing su support for Black men within our sample. So the second question then was whether or not um, support would increase for women within our sample for whom this feminist treatment is supposed to be recognizing their struggle. And what we find is that the nationalist treatment, which we thought might positively uh, increase support for Black Lives Matter, had no statistically significant effect, but neither did the feminist or the LGBTQ uh, finding as well. Um, so Black women in our sample aren't any more likely to support Black Lives Matter or less likely to support Black Lives Matter if they receive the feminist LGBTQ plus or Black uh, nationalist treatment. So while the men were generally less supportive as a result of intersectional messages, women demonstrated a similar level of support across all treatments and were no more likely to be mobilized by feminist treatment that spoke directly to a particular violence that Black women might face. Um, which we thought was was somewhat surprising, but we'll talk about you know why that might be in the conclusion. So I did also moderate these results on LGBTQ plus affiliation. I will say um, we are completely underpowered to have LGBTQ plus identifiers. We tried uh, to see if we could get an oversample, but it was uh, not to be. Um, so of course we'll have no results across all those treatments, but I don't wanna read into them too much just because of the power of our sample. Um, for the non-LGBTQ plus respondents though, we did have sufficient power to be able to look at what these results might mean. And again, we do see a negative depression um, of support for Black Lives Matter for both the feminist and the LGBTQ plus treatments um, on, on most of our dependent variables. Um, which again speaks to this idea that intersectional framing, if anything so far, is leading to less support um, among, uh, among subgroups for whom it is not speaking rather than necessarily increased support for subjects for whom it is speaking. Okay, so the second part of the study was to think not just about what support looked like for Black Lives Matter, but a question of how this might shift how um, respondents are thinking about or talking about Black Lives Matter. So to consider this question, excuse me, we asked respondents to write a message um, to the Speaker of the House at the time, Nancy Pelosi, um, in support of Black Lives Matter. So this figure here on, on the right is showing just the average length of the message. Um, so for 148 subjects of ours actually complied by writing this letter. So that's just uh, just an, just over half of our sample. Um, and the messages were quite short, actually. So what I'm showing you here is just the, the mapping of the length of the message by how, you know, the per proportion of our sample that, that is uh, responding to it. And so the longest message um, that we received was about 1,200 characters, which is still not super long, um, but most of our messages were around 100 characters, so just one, maybe two sentences at most. Um, and what's interesting here is we didn't see a difference in the likeliness of whether a respondent would write a letter or not based on their treatment. Um, 
And we also didn't really see any of the eight people who received intersectional treatment specifically discussing the groups that we indicated that Black Lives Matter highlighted. So we did not see um, those who received a Black feminist treatment specifically talking about the unique challenges that Black women may face or um, those who received the LGBTQ plus treatment talking about uh, the challenges that LGBTQ plus Black individuals might face, but we did see that the content of the messages shifted based on the treatments. Um, and I'll show you those results. Oop, oop, sorry, my computer's getting happy. Okay, all right, so here again, I'm showing you the differences based on gender. Um, so female respondents on the left, male respondents on the right. And again, I apologize for not having those who are non-binary or gender non-conforming. We, we just did not have enough individuals in our sample. So I apologize for the, for the, the binary gender presentation here. Um, okay, so um, on the left-hand side, this is the same um, setup of displayed results as I showed before. So the treatment effect here on the x-axis, the y-axis is showing um, four different dependent variables. So whether or not they wrote a message at all, whether or not they asked, uh, Speaker Pelosi for support of Black Lives Matter, whether or not they mentioned disparities at all, regardless of whom they are talking about, um, just generally disparities between Black communities and white communities, or even within Black communities, um, and whether or not uh, police were mentioned. And for our female respondents, we see we saw no treatment variation except on messages uh, about mentioning the police. And there we saw the nationalist framing having a positive significant effect and the LGBTQ plus framing had a, had a not quite statistically significant effect. I think the P was 0.08 there, but I think, I think it's worth mentioning just to see that, um, that there are cases where we might see the police mentioned even though um, there was no direct message of them within our treatment. For our male respondents, again, we saw very little differentiation whether or not they wrote a message or asked support, which are our first two variables here. Um, but we did see a positive increase in whether or not they mentioned disparities faced by Black communities as a whole um, or, or at large. Um, I will say, again, having gone through them, they did not talk about specific subgroups here. So I can say this is Black communities as a whole, if they receive the nationalist treatment and only if they receive the nationalist treatment. Black men in general uh, did not have any treatment variation about mentioning the police and they were much less likely than Black women uh, to talk about the police in general. So interestingly, what we're seeing is that the support um, that we saw above did not necessarily carry over into who wrote a message or who asked support for Black Lives Matter, but we do see a little bit of variation um, based on what the message content was by the treatment, um, just along mentions of disparities and mentions of the police. Um, again, I'll present um, what we talked about with our LGBTQ plus affiliation, um, dividing between those who identified as LGBTQ plus and those who didn't. Again, we're super underpowered for LGBTQ plus respondents, but I do think it's worth mentioning um, that this is the one place where we start to see a potential effect for LGBTQ plus identifiers, even though we don't have the power, um, we do see a positive effect on having the message written. And so I think it's worth noting that future work might want to look to see within, um, perhaps there might be an elevating effect to talking about Black LGBTQ plus identifiers within Black Lives Matter. Um, if, if we were looking to see for, uh, not to select on independent variable, but I think it would be worth looking further at that group with more power um, if possible. When we look at non-LGBTQ plus respondents, um, we do see actually a slight decrease in support for those asking support if they receive the feminist treatment. Um, and a slight and a, and a positive, statistically significant positive increase both in mentioning the police and then I think a point P.10 response if they, were, if they receive the national treatment and mentioning disparities. So again, we see a little bit of movement on the message content itself based on the treatment, um, but, it, uh, but it does not necessarily correspond 
with that intersectional treatment framing in general. Um, so I think what we find from the messaging differences here that's important to consider is that um, is that these intersectional treatments do not necessarily make groups more or less willing to be um, active around Black Lives Matter. And that might have something to do, uh, that probably has something to do with things we cannot control for here, such as how much people are already supporting the movement or how politically active they are just in general. Okay, so what can we conclude from this? Um, our hypotheses suggest that intersectional messaging would mobilize different segments of the Black community differently. Um, and I think that's what we saw, um, but it didn't necessarily go the way that we thought it would. So we didn't see greater support for Black Lives Matter among groups whose plights may be less frequently discussed. So for instance, um, building off of hashtag say her name or hashtag Black trans women's lives matter, we might anticipate that mentioning and trying to educate people um, along these lines might increase mobilization of Black women, um, or Black LGBTQ plus individuals, individuals, but we did not find evidence that that was the case. What we did see, however, was that attention to particular subgroups within Black communities did decrease the amount of support we saw um, from Black individuals, Oops. sorry, uh, among black, and black males within our sample, and I think that was um, we, we thought we might see that, but we're hoping to see uh, more, more support among Black women and Black LGBTQ identifiers. Um, and I think it's worth just sitting with and thinking about here what this means for intersectionality and social movements, because I think um, the possibility, one possible implication of this is that we shouldn't try to do intersectionality and social movements. All it does is decrease mobilization among key group members. And if we think about black men uh, within our sample, that's a pretty substantial portion of the folks we would want to mobilize on this. But I would push back a little bit on that implication because I think there's a lot more here, both from other research and, and what we might hope to see. So I would really emphasize um, a couple of of critical findings um, that we found here that I think are really important when we consider what this means both for Black Lives Matter, but also what I think it could mean for the implications um, of intersectionality within social movements. So I think the first point here is that no matter what demographic group or treatment we look at within this data, on average support for Black Lives Matter is incredibly high. And it remains high across communities of Black respondents, right? So even as we're seeing that depression among Black male support, it's significant and critical for understanding Black public opinion. It doesn't really necessarily indicate a wholesale disaffection for Black men from the movement. It just signals that Black men are less likely to be activated by particular messages. And we're still working on understanding why this is. So I think this leads to really important important future research. It could be generalized differences in socialization of Black individuals by gender, right, such as um, Jen Jackson suggests in her work, or it could be, as we saw earlier, because Black men grapple with intersectionality differently than do Black women, or it could be something else that, that we're not finding or not even thinking about yet. Um, I think the second thing that's really important to take away is that this study speaks to difficulty of navigating online or decentralized social justice movements, right? So the control of message and the content of the message is much harder when different communities, both ideologically and geographically situated, may highlight different pieces of the message. And so while there's a shared collective ideal, these messages and actions may be interpreted interpreted differently. And so I think for students of social movement, there's implications here about what it might mean to effectively communicate with the new social movements. Um, I think the last point here is really about how the public understands intersectionality. So just as it highlights how much the work, I think it highlights, you know, just how much the work the founders of Black Lives Matter and other Black queer feminist leaders are doing and how difficult the work is. So intersectionality, as, as you all who are in the seminar, I'm sure know, it's not a simple concept and it's not something that everyone is familiar with. And so one thing is that the general public may not quite understand what, interse what intersectionality means or even why it may need to be highlighted. So our treatments were pretty small, 
right? We didn't go very deeply into what um, this particular kind of violence that Black women or Black LGBTQ plus identifiers may face. And so it's it's possibly the case that portions of the public and not just the Black public, public may not agree that intersectionality matters in a real way or even understand the implications for why it would need to be centered within a social movement or social policy. And so leaders of Black Lives Matter are doing really two really important forms of education. Um, first, the social experiences that Black communities are facing to outside communities, but they're also doing education within and without Black communities as to how particular Black sub-communities within the Black communities experience multiple burdens. And that due focus visibly means that the uptake of an intersectional message can be slightly lower. Um, and, and has subsequent implications for mobilization. And so I think this, this latter part is where Al and I are trying to go next is to really understand how much of this um, is, is the education that needs to happen to the public of what intersectionality means. So with that, I'm open for questions. I'm gonna stop the share unless we need to go back. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate those thoughtful remarks. Uh, I'm going to see. Great. Now everyone can see me better. It's a little confusing because the sound is coming through somewhere else. There we are. But thank you so much for joining us. If anyone has a question, I invite you to go down to, for most of you, it'll be in the reactions tab. For others, it'll be in the participants, depending on if you've updated your Zoom recently or not and click the raise hand icon. That way we'll know to unmute you. And for those of you who are present in the case in room, you are also invited to ask a question. Um, great, I see Zoe has one and then we'll go to you, Anne. All right, give me just one second. Thanks, Katie, and thanks so much, Tabitha. This is really exciting to hear you present, um, and congratulations on the publication. I think this is all out in the world, so I'll just stick to questions that I think are answered elsewhere in the paper, but um, one question I had is I'm really curious about the kind of extension and investment treatment that you asked, or um, part of the experiment where you asked them to send a note to Speaker Pelosi, and this is really just a technical question from a researcher to researcher perspective, but did you then pass those notes on to the speaker. And then my longer question, um, uh, sort of two. One, I'm curious if the results surprised you or if they're more or less what you expected. And I'm also curious what your thoughts are on whether you targeted people who'd kind of been more active in the movement um, or if you had been able, based on sort of your data to break it down generationally, whether you think that you might see slightly different results under either a younger generation or people who had sort of participated in protests? Yeah, um, all good questions. So I'll start, so if I, you may need to bump me if I if I miss one of them. Okay, so the, the, the question on whether we pass the messages along to Speaker Pelosi, the answer is no, we wanted to. Um, but I think when we are looking at how people communicate with with their elected representatives, it's most often they want to know whether or not, like where within uh, the region you are. So most of the ways we found to pass through those messages were really wanting identifiers. Um, and so it just didn't, didn't seem to make sense um, for us to be able to do that. So what we did instead was at the end of our survey, we debriefed by saying, that we were actually unable to pass them along to her, um, but we repeated the message that they said. We said, here's what you wrote and put the message and they said, you can send this long tour by clicking this link and filling out this form and copying and pasting it in there. So I don't know who did that. My guess is that probably fewer, right? right? Like if we lost just under half getting to the message, I'm sure we lost uh, a substantial amount more even doing it. Um, and, and, you know, some of the messages were, were funny things like, um, Nancy Pelosi, you crazy lady, you better support Black Lives Matter. Um, and some of them were, were formal with uh, salutations and signatures. So, so I, I imagine that most people did not 
forward them on, unfortunately. But we did we did want to send them. So if anyone has better ideas for how to connect that piece, I would love to hear them. Um, I think your your other question. Um, okay, so I so we do have some questions on participation that we collected with the demographic data. Um, we also had we looked at age um, and we looked at religion actually because. As religion is such an important mobilizer for Black activists historically, um, thinking that we might see some differences. Um, and we also looked at region. And please forgive me, it's been a little while since I've looked deep into all the data within the appendix. We did find some regional differences. Um, I think I think in the West, they were less likely um, to be to be motivated, um, but it didn't. Nothing really seemed to align in a way that we anticipated. Like there was no clear reason. So I think we thought, for instance, religious people um, might be less likely to support a black feminist message, um, just just from the perspective that often the you know, patriarchal hierarchy is very more often strongly represented uh, within faith cultures. Not always, but we thought perhaps we could see there, and we did not see there. We looked at age, um, and I think we did find some significant findings with age, but nothing seemed to align in a way that that made sense to us. Um, so I, I I discussed it, put it in the appendix, and I I don't remember. So if if it is not easy to find, I am happy to email emailed the appendix to you and what you found, because I, I think it's definitely worth looking at all those. And was there one more question you asked me that I missed? I should have written them down. It was just simply if the results surprised you. Oh, um, I think I think I was sad. <laughs> I think I think um, I, I think I mean, I think we were fully prepared for it to go either way. Um, that that there would be increased mobilization of black women. I mean, and we do look at LGBTQ plus because we had we we could, um, but really gender a binary gender distinction is the easier one to look at just because that's where we had the data. And so we thought there might we were we were we thought there might be an increase among black black women. Um, so I was a little bit surprised by not, but I will say I talked to um, Jen Jackson who has amazing research also on intersectionality um, in Black communities around police violence. And I think I think after talking with her, I think I was like, okay, I shouldn't have been surprised just because um, Black women have such a strong political socialization um, that I think we're probably reaching somewhat of a ceiling effect here, right? Like they're, you know, we're not, everyone is not at a five on all the scales. But, you know, there's only so much movement you might expect to see for people who are already really strongly supporting something and politically active. So, so yes, I was surprised and a little disappointed, but also I think just given context, I think it makes more sense. Thanks. Thank you so much, Zoe. Great, so someone in Kaysen has a question for you. Yeah, I thank you very much um, for your presentation. I had a, a question about your, your, your so the questions that you ask about their knowledge about the Black Lives Matter movement, I wonder if you if you also measured the extent to which they were accurate accurate regarding their the extent to which they really knew about the movement. So, for instance, do they know that some of the people who um, uh, launched the movement were actually women? Uh, do they actually even think of um, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, being um, not just about you know police violence, but it's actually a much broader movement in itself, because they might think that they actually have a really good knowledge of what the Black Lives Matter movement is, but maybe they don't actually. Um, so that's a great question. So scanning through here, looking to see. Um, so we did not. We just asked that single question and how familiar you are, and, and it, it's self-identifying their own knowledge. We struggled with this because we did want a better measure of knowledge, but it was hard to think about how to do it without cueing something on our treatments. Um, so, so if we were to ask, for instance, you know, are you are you either because one of the questions is like, do you know who started it? Well, it's black queer women. <laughs> Or like, do you, and, and I, I think it was hard for us to think of how to do that without also kind of doing a, a potential priming um, to the idea that there was, you know, we're interested in thinking about 
a gender or a, a sexuality identity here. Um, I think so. The the Center for the Study of Diversity and Democracy, Democracy and Diversity. I always get the order mixed up. Here at Northwestern with Al and I has we so we did just the general Black Lives Matter survey, and so I think um, we asked one question there that you might find interesting that that's not directly asking what you're speaking to, but suggests that I do think there is, it would be, it would be worth it if we could think of a way to, to kind of investigate this more about who, who founded it and who, like what the message was that we probably do have some disconnect between this familiarity. Um, so one question that, that was asked was who should lead the Black Lives Matter movement? And at that point, and this was, 2018, fall of 2018, the overwhelming majority of response, well, not majority, but I think 30% of responses was Colin Kaepernick. Um, and, and only, you know, five, five percent, I think said Patrice Colors, 10% said Alicia Garza. So it was, you know, people at that point were really highly supportive of someone like Colin Kaepernick leading the movement. And, and so I think this goes to your point of what I'm inferring you making is that there's probably a huge disconnect between what people think they know and what they actually know. And I'm sure that that has implications for their support as well. Um, but I, th I think at least teasing, I think we could tease it out descriptively, but I think it would be really hard to do so within the context of this experiment. Yeah. Thank you. Erica, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, once again for this really interesting research and, and for presenting it to us. Uh, I think it's so important because, um, you know, for, for social movements, there are only so many things that they can control. Uh, and one of the things that they can control sometimes is their message, notwithstanding the problems of uh, the digital age, et cetera, but they can have like narrative and message discipline. And what your research does is it helps to parse you know, which communities are mobilized or demobilized or demotivated um, based on choices that the, the movement can make. Um, I think for me, um, there are a couple of different practical questions that come up, which is, you know, in a decentralized movement where there may be less, for lack of a better term, um, uh, narrative discipline or kind of consolidation of core messages, um, it, it makes me wonder, you know, how separate the, the sort of treatments are, right? So there, there's definitely um, elements of uh, the broader kind of movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter adjacent organizations that I, I can easily imagine seeing using the types of um, narratives that you were labeling nationalist um, claims uh, compared with um, the more intersectional ones. And so, you know, how do you account for the fact that these are sort of all emerging at the same time and, and um, intersecting with one another uh, and, and the way that that might have really complicated effects. Um, the second thing that, that I was thinking about is just the way that we talk about intersectionality and you brought this up in your concluding thoughts that, you know, maybe, maybe it's not that the concept is complicated, but the language we have for it right now is just overly complex and less resonant or less um, accessible uh, to people. Uh, than say kind of core concepts like slavery, colonialism, reparations, things that um, if people know exactly what, what you mean when you say those things compared to like heteronormativity, um, which might just be a turnoff. It's not even about the concept, it's just the, 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 the term. Um, so I was just wondering about, about that. And, and then the, the last thing I couldn't really quite make out was whether um, you were finding that people uh, that black men um, with regard to the intersectional frames, whether they were actually um, just less likely to support it or were they actively, were, were you eliciting a backlash effect in the sense that they, that they were more likely to be alienated from or even counter mobilize uh, to some extent? Um, and, you know, if, if not, um, is the core takeaway for these movements that, you know, if you decide that, that it's time to sort of elevate and center the claims of black women um, and queer women uh, of color, um, does that basically mean that uh, you, you might have to go it alone without black male allies, but you can still get a lot done? Um, or is that really going to risk establishing an adverse coalition that you 
really have to worry about within the community. So those are a couple thoughts. Yeah, those are those are good. So you'll have to again. I, I tried to write write things down, but if I miss something, uh, push me back in the right direction. <laughs> um, so I think the first question you asked was really about um, contextualizing this and grounding it in kind of the reality that multiple like these messages might be happening at the same time, they might be competing. And I think, you know, for us within the experiment, I think we can say, you know, whatever, thankfully, because, you know, we can, I think we can count on random assignment here, whatever they brought in with them, probably someone else in another treatment group brought something similar. And so I think, you know, this lets us distill just that single component. And so I think the question is what happens when when all these things are competing. And I think, I will say we saw a little bit of this competition in some of our messages, which is actually why I found that part really informative as a researcher, even though we didn't report everything, is that we did see, not a lot, but we did see a handful of people push back and say, what, that's not what Black Lives Matter is, it's this. And, and so I do think you're right, that people are, hearing multiple pieces of messaging and kind of sticking and claim and owning pieces of them. And so I think, I think, I think, you know, for our experiment, I think because we we should expect to see that happening across groups, um, that that we can we can say that, you know, the the messaging effects that we saw make sense and hold through, but what happens, you know, when you get them at the same time. And I think I, I think it's probably they, you know, probably a counterframing type issue that we expect, you know, per per Jamie Druckmann and, and Dennis Chong that, you know, it might push them in different ways. Um, they might be less likely to pay attention to an intersectional message, right, um, than another one. So I don't know, I don't know in terms of how, I, I think experimentally we did the best we could to, to prevent that. If anything, it probably decreased differences between our groups. Um, but I don't, yeah, beyond that, I don't know. Um, I do, I agree. I think we used somewhat complicated language and I don't think we went in as in depth into what intersectionality is and kind of a, a easy way to understand, right? So for instance, I think some of the campaigning around black trans women that is done just to talk about the number of women, black trans women who die at the hands of police is really informative and compelling. Um, and I, I'm curious to know if we had you know, made a choice to talk about it in terms of um, of an, an example or an individual, if we might see different, maybe not different effects in terms of, I think, I think we might, I think, if anything, I think that would have exacerbated our effects, right? Because I think we're making stronger this idea that Black Lives Matter isn't necessarily what they, they thought it was, or maybe it just didn't resonate with them. So I think, I think what that means though, is that it's a challenge, um, it's a challenge of education for, for what these movement founders are doing, that they're doing the work of two things at one time. Um, and so I, I would be curious, and Alan, I have a couple of, uh, of experiments where we're trying to look to see if we can, you know, simplifying language or trying to, um, to make things a little bit clearer and more resonant um, might, might shift results, but I don't, unfortunately, they don't have those results now, but I think it's a really important thing to look at and to consider, and I think might be helpful, um, particularly as more movements are starting to think about intersectionality. Um, in terms of Black men, I think it's hard to know, based on our data, whether or not that message really just decreased support or if it actively worked to alienate or mobilize them from the movement, I think it's really hard to say because all, all we can report is that support went down. Um, I don't think, right, we, this, I think this would be the case, it'd be nice to have a pre-post uh, measure and, and we, we don't, and I think it might be hard to do, um, but I included a pre-post support measure in our latest experiment. So maybe that's a, we can, we can get back to that to see, because I, I think in order to tell if it's really alienating them, we would need to see that support actually decrease as a result of the message and we we don't have that we just know it's less than if they didn't get it so yes I don't know this is a good question and I, I think I don't know Jen, I think Jen I had Jen Jackson and I spent way too long as you can tell talking about this she <laughs> she I think it's helpful to think about just in general her work that shows that black men are, are socially politicized are, are politically socialized differently um, to be 
less politically active. And so I, I think I think it's equally plausible to just say they didn't feel as compelled to act rather than they were turned off by it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to Professor Benia and to all of you for attending. We have exhausted our time, but not our questions and curiosity. So thank you so much for such a stimulating conversation.